Wesley Schultz, Jeremiah Freights, the Lumineers. Yeah. How are you? Doing well. Good. Yeah. Hanging in there, yeah. Congrats. I mean, i tell you what I love about you guys. So I, I'll, I'll tell you um, a small thing about me is that I'm a, a musician before I did this, and I play, like, traditional music, so, like, folk music and, and, and banjo and accordion music. And I spend a lot of time playing house concerts. Yeah. And I love that you guys started out playing house concerts. But I, I have to imagine it must be a little bit of a trip to start out playing in people's, like, living rooms and now have this big film at the Toronto <laughs> Film Trim, Toronto Film Festival. Does it ever hit you? Well, we're actually playing a house show in a couple of days. So do you guys still yeah. do the house shows? Yeah, some. It's. I think it's a way to s keep you sharp. You know, you can't really hide behind some trickery when you're just two feet from someone in their living room. <laughs> right. Um, but it does feel, it does feel surreal, and um, I don't. I don't think we've ever stopped saying that over the last like seven years. You know, <laughs> everything is. But up to that point, it felt surreal for how bad it was going. <laughs> yeah. And now, and now it's uh, we pinch ourselves and um, I don't know. You just try to. I feel like with luck, you try to meet it halfway. You, you say like, if I'm grateful for this, then I have to work even harder, you know, to honor that stroke of luck I was given, because um, we just wanted to be musicians. We didn't really know where it would lead, but we were like, this would be really cool and. Did things like slice meats at a deli and yeah. Yeah. you know a barista and all that other this stuff. This is this isn't even the Grammys. I mean, this isn't even like a, a music thing. This you, you, this is a film festival. It's I think it made it easier for me personally to, to enjoy something like this because I didn't understand it as much as the Grammys. Like I know what the Grammys entails. I know what that means as a musician yeah. and being not in film. Obviously, it was easier to like kind of just roll with the punches and be like, "This is cool." <laughs> like it just I felt like a visitor at something. And uh, I was super grateful, and I, my mind is blown that we're even here. But uh, it was, I think, a little easier to... It was still overwhelming, but when we were at the Grammys uh, on our first album, it was just kind of a lot of pressure because you, you are there to, like, win something, and there's winners and losers at the Grammys, and this just felt like... We were really, losers, man. Yeah. <laughs> and we lost both. Uh, Didn't want to bring it up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, we're proud of that. Here's my question. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about this film because I, I really loved it. And it, um, it, it felt very personal to me. Wesley, can you tell us a little about these journals first? Uh, yeah. The um, It was just a simple kind of... Uh, it was a weird situation. I was moving and I found uh, old journals. And for me, the older it is, the more enjoyable it is to look back and see you know your your thoughts and and if they've evolved or if, if they're exactly the same spot you were uh in this case it was oh seven i think the journals were from and it said three eps all work alone and work together as an lp so it was like this concept that we never really pulled off and um the working title was something different it was like love loss and crimes and so for this one we actually tried to superimpose that name onto it, and the songs weren't actually about those things in, in a true sense. Um, so the journal was just about the format of what you wanted to do, not about addiction, nothing about... No, I mean, it had it also had lyrics from Jimmy Sparks in it, actually. So we were... Uh, that's one of the songs on the new record, and we were... So some of these songs, Life in the City and Jimmy Sparks, and some other ones are like an older ideas or older songs, but most of it was just the general concept of enjoying um, taking small... Uh, you know, chapters like our friends would give us their EPs. I remember, you know, our friends from like s this band in Denver, Science Partner, they gave us a CP and we wore it out. It was only three or four songs, but we tended to listen to it more. Mm. So we thought, well, it would be really enjoyable to do that. But we were told by record companies that it wasn't the way things go, it's not how business is done. So it's a bad idea. And it the system won't really support you if you if you do it this way because it's not set up to roll it out and then we saw netflix and how they you know put out an entire season of you know popular tv shows and people just binge it at their own right. rate and so we wanted to put out more at a time you know at, at one time and not be defined by a single because we're not really like we're not that type of band even though we had a really big single um on our first album and then had some more i think after i'd like to think um but it was more like we were trying to make albums all along and the, and the deeper cuts were, were really important to us. So it was a way to like more thoroughly define a new record for, for an audience that is, is weighing out whether they're going to get into the album or not. But it, it's, such, it's such a personal, it feels like such a personal record. And doing the little bit of research that I did, I, I found out that it is based around some family experiences that we definitely do not need to get into if you guys don't want to get into it. But I, I will ask this, Jeremiah, when did you 
guys first start opening up to one another about these experiences that you guys have had um, in your families? I mean, for for a long time, I've known Wes a long time, and we've always Wes was friends with uh, my older brother Joshua, who did die of a, a drug overdose about almost twenty years ago. So um, it's always been on our mind. I mean, ironically, or whatever word, uh, when we first started writing together about fourteen years ago. Um, a lot of the lyrics were about, there was a song about my brother, there was a song about, um, you know, just different things that had happened to me in Wes's life that were on the sadder side or on the tragic side. And I think um, he had, like, kind of rehashing this for me. Um, a lot of this stuff, unfortunately, has been going on, um, you know, recently in Wes's world. And then for me, it brought up a lot of old feelings that I, I guess I felt like i not forgotten about because you never forget about, you know, grief and trauma. But it just was a – it brought a lot of things from the back up to the surface. And I think in a weird way, that was a good sign, though. It was like if I'm feeling this um, emotional, if I'm feeling this almost like, like – raw. Yeah, something. this raw and this like, wow, this, this almost apprehension about releasing something that is so specific about something – that's good. That's a good sign. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think the more personal you get, the more universal it becomes. And uh, I think that was a good sign that I was feeling, wow, I'm feeling raw right now. Imagine how fans are going to feel. So. Yeah, especially fans. I mean, and everyone is touched by this right now. I mean, that's. The, I think when you watch it, it's hard to think about anything besides your own experiences with people in your own life who have suffered from addiction, you know, the way it can ravage a family. Wes, again, like mm-hmm. as much as you want to, but yeah, like, yeah. talk to me a little bit about what, what maybe inspired you on this journey. I think it was just being really troubled by watching um, a family member, I would say a couple in different ways, but particularly one, um, spiral. And, um, you know, it was someone that we we tried to help. So, you know, we got her a little place, uh, thought that might fix the problem. Then we put her in rehab, and then she left rehab three different times, and then... um, she ended up in jail. We got a call, and now it's, now she's been on the streets, just homeless or in and out of CD hotels, and it's 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 really difficult to watch on a lot of levels because there's still there's still a t- so much love there, even if you're not in communication. It's actually like a ghost haunting you, where you don't know what call you're gonna get, you don't know what's around the corner. It's like a boogeyman, you know, but in the worst of ways because you love the person. So I think writing the record. The way we did, it felt like a meditation on it, but not in a way of relaxing meditation. It was like, I can't figure this out, and I'm very troubled by this. So maybe if I almost like exercise it, you know, like exercise a demon, if you can put it on paper or say it out loud, maybe it will it will take some of the power away from it to keep you up at night or for me to obsess over it. And it, it has helped to share it, but it's also helped in a way of, I think we're lucky as musicians to take something that's painful and somehow that that's cathartic for someone else. I think that I used to listen to, and I still do, before every show I listen to extremely sad music. I don't know why. That's just what I am gra- gravitate towards. It's this weird, it feeds me, it makes me feel alive, you know, oddly, to, to, um, to focus on some of those emotions. And f- to feel alive is to feel emotion. So... I think we felt like we we might turn a lot of people off by writing about this because um, I remember sitting down and there was almost like a weird, not a standoff, but we were, I remember saying we were working on like the third or fourth song and it was about the same thing again. And I said, Jerry, I'm, I'm sorry, but this is all I know. This is all I really can talk about right yeah. now. It's almost like you're stuck on it. Yeah. And the music was a way to like get past it maybe or move, move on a little bit. And, um, Luckily, you know, I think we talked about it and, and communicated well about it to the point where Jared knew where I was coming from with it because I think he was like, why are you bringing this up, man? I don't want to think about this, and I bet your fans don't really want to, you know. And then now we look, and it's we, we were just both processing things, and, and, you know, he's been through so much, like, at a young age to now, like, and now he's a father and so am I, and it's like all this, you know, all this stuff, and you think we'd be singing about how lucky we are, but that's really not what you use music for. You know well, what that, I mean? Like, that, that's interesting to me because that, that was kind of where I wanted to go next is that I know you guys are both new new dads. How old, how old are your kids? About a year and a half. Yeah. Yeah, and when I watched this film, which is, we'll say, like a companion of the album or whatever we want to say, but it's a film scored entirely by the album with no dialogue. Um. 
in addition to being about addiction and the Wake and Ravage family, I saw it as being about intergenerational trauma, the yeah. way that trauma can be passed from one generation to another. Yeah. And um, yeah, totally. Jeremy, I'll go to you on this. Like, how much of this is on your mind as a, as a parent? I think a lot. <laughs> Um, in good ways and bad. I mean, there's only so much you can teach your kids, and then there's a lot that they just get from genetics. And we were talking about that in the way over here. Like, you know, some people see a deck of cards, and they'll just never get addicted to gambling. And some people see a deck of cards, and they're like, wow, you know, this this thing happens where, and whether that's with a di- uh, alcohol, you know, sex, binge eating, gambling, whatever it might be. Um yeah, I mean, you think about the scary world that you're bringing your kids into, and I, there's a scene I really love from this movie, the film, um, where Junior Sparks, the youngest character, played by Charlie Tahan, I just noticed this last night when we were watching it at TIFF, uh, there's this burning piano, and the smoke is, like, all going to one way, and you see him get in the car, and you see him going, driving the truck in the same way as the, the direction of the smoke, mm. And I bet you if we ask Kevin Phillips, the director, that that's not a coincidence. Just because every time we've asked him about something, the amount of details he put in this film is so absurd that <laughs> we thought, like, he would miss something. We're like, hey, Jim, you know, Jimmy Sparks actually worked at a prison. You never mentioned that. He'd be like, no, there was a police badge and, like, all this yeah. stuff in his bedroom. <laughs> We're like, what? So this idea that Junior Sparks was driving in the same direction as the smoke, I think was a little bit ominous and a little bit foreboding for his character in a sad way. Hope not, though. You know, Junior, I think, represented that choice that we get. And, um, yeah, I think it's almost too much to try to contemplate as a parent, you know, what what's going to go wrong and what could go wrong, and you just yeah. take it day by day. I think it's – I literally can't go there about thinking about if my son – succumb to you know what my older brother went through it's it's really a place i couldn't couldn't go to i i understand wesley how about you is it is it on your mind yeah yeah for sure it's it's um uh i i i i I often i think that was part of the writing of the record and then making the videos was how much free will you have how much um is the sins of your father or the sins of the mother are they passed down how much of it is passed down you know we end up we always, you know, as people, we're always joking that we end up just like, you know, someone in our family, usually a parent, and you, you always thought they were so out of touch when you were a kid, you know. So um, there's that, but I think the, I think there's another component, which is I'm happy that we made something like this because I think kids are way more intuitive and intelligent, even at a very young age, and the, you, can, you can say a lot of wise things to them, and they'll just go right in one year out the other or just over their head. But if the way you live and the example you set is speaks way louder to a child, you know? So my parents were always telling me to be honest. And when I was, they rewarded me. So it made me who I am because of how they lived, you know? So I think for us talking about this, even though there's a kid drinking out of a vodka bottle in a scene, yeah, a baby that really happens. And, to be honest about it is important. Instead of shielding your kid from, from image, not, not that he should see this when he's super young, but it's just, it's you, if you the more you shelter a kid, I think you're doing them a disservice. You have to, like I will curse around my kid, not 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 over the top and not unnecessarily, yeah. but he'll have to know that those words exist and how to use them instead of pretending like it just doesn't. Yeah. And uh, so my dad was very communicative. He was a psychologist, and he, he just taught us to try to be honest and try to express yourself. And so I hope our kids both look at what we're doing not as anything but trying to be honest, you know, and express that. And then maybe they'll live like that instead of hiding it. You know, we keep talking about how it's an unexpected taboo uh, addiction considering how many people are dealing with it. Mm. There's a lot of if, – if you polled – I just can't believe how many people are either touched by it or yeah. di- directly or indirectly. It's like six degrees of separation, but even smaller. It's, it's, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's literally everybody. Yeah. And that's kind of where I, I kind of want to close off like that. But before I do that, I do want to change topics just a little tiny bit because it's not every day that I get to speak to you. Um, and I, 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 I want to go fully kind of off the film just for one question. Yeah. You know, earlier you said something interesting, Wesley. You said, you know, when we got this new record out, we have this new EP, series of EPs. You know, we've had a lot of success. We had this big single, and I and I I hope we've had other ones. You know, I hope we've had other ones. I want to point out that I know that gratitude is paramount in this business. I know it's important to be grateful for what you have, and not everyone gets the song like the mm. Ho Hey song. 
But I, I am curious about what your relationship is with that song right now. I mean, it's the soundtrack to, I know it's a question you get a lot, but it's the soundtrack yeah. to everyone's wedding, to, to <laughs> films. I wanted to know how you guys feel about it. Yeah, I mean, I I said this the other night on stage. It feels like um, playing a cover song. It feels like we used to play cover songs in bars a lot. And um, it feels like that kind of thing where it's it's in the fabric of something. It's no longer yours. It's sort of like the people's <laughs> material. And um, so it doesn't feel and not in a bad way. It just it's it's it, the other the other songs in the set. I would say you know get actually get sometimes bigger reactions most of the time. Like stubborn love is an mm -hmm. example, or slow it down or something like that. Where you have these songs that just l people have a relationship with, but that one feels like you could hear it anywhere and you wouldn't be that surprised if you're like we'd be in a. At one point, it was on everywhere, and so. It doesn't really feel like yours anymore. That's the best way to describe like it. Like you don't feel the same emotional attachment to it you did when you wrote it. You don't feel the same. I tried to reconnect on it. It's 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 just an interesting song because it was about a breakup and it became a wedding song. And oh, I had, isn't that funny? And I had heard the same story told by Bono about the song One years earlier. And I was like, oh, that must be weird. And then it happened to us where people were like, I got married to that song. Yeah, one of my best friends and got I married was like, to that song. I was like certain the yeah, song called The Dead Sea was going to be the single. Because when we had the album, I don't think everybody was like, oh, it's going to be Ho Hey. And then hindsight's twenty twenty, but we actually played Ho Hey on this Craig Ferguson show. Yeah. Which, I love that guy, but you know, it was like a smaller late night TV show within the United States. And that was the first time. And then we were going to go play... I think like Leno they, or something. Yeah, Leno or Letterman at the time. And uh, it was our second time. And I didn't know that you just play the junket you know you just go through like ho hey on all of them yeah and i remember i think me and west were like all right management we're gonna play the dead sea in this and she was like you don't understand like you're just gonna play ho hey or you're not gonna be on the show <laughs> for a really long time yeah, yeah. And we're like, oh, okay and we're gonna do Fair that enough. all the yeah. late night shows and like all of them so yeah. i was i was certain though that dead sea was gonna be this like huge smash that would have been a good wedding song that, if <laughs> yeah. you are getting married to that song you're making the right decision I think it just shows you. I've read other interviews too that the artist is so far off usually from the song that makes it I think you just you see a whole album and you see every song as a snowflake and other people are like that's the single well that's why I mean I think it's really interesting that Yellow was the last song on Parachutes like they were yeah. you know, Coldplay like they were in mm. their they were in the parking lot when they brought it on I can't tell you how many artists we have on our show who say that it was like yeah. it was the last song in the record really but I always think there's something psychological about it it is the one that we're not necessarily attached to no, I don't <laughs> I don't like resent it but I no. think it's less personal when everyone's heard it in that way I think that I have a close relationship with songs that I feel like is my little secret my I you know it's mine and mine alone it feels like you know versus something that um, I think it was just overplayed that's what happens you know when, when something is played that much I believe it's a really good song I, see, yeah. it I just think got, a lot of songs it are just overplayed. got <laughs> played <laughs> to, to death honest, yeah and now it's when we play it we enjoy playing it but uh and you're grateful for the sort of doors it opened, but you could almost lose touch with that it was a good song because you don't want to be defined by it, so you start to look at it differently. Yeah. And I think we were lucky that we talked about like almost crawling out of its shadow. It was like this monolith. It was like this thing blocking the sun, and and the challenge was to write your way out of it. You know. So writing. I mean, I'm 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 really happy that people are asking us about our album because mm -hmm. on album two. The only questions we ever got were, so, were you nervous? Sophomore slump? Oh, good. You're a big band. Please explain. Please justify this. And it was like, well, we do have others. We have a, you know, if you yeah. go to our shows, our fans actually know a, this, these albums front to back. So to be able to surprise people is, is still like a really, it's a joy to be, to, for those people who are just coming with a friend that thought they were coming to this type of show and it turned out to be this other kind of thing. But I think for us, that's been really gratifying on this album cycle that's yeah. starting is that people want to know about Gloria and they want to know about these chapters and it's it's fresh and it's something we we think is important to talk about. Well, well let me, I think we, can I just do one, I know you guys have, have a laser beam pointed at your head right now <laughs> for, for, to get out of this interview, but I, I do want to, I do want to ask one more thing. Uh, and Jeremy, Jeremiah, maybe I'll leave this with you is that, you know, I was watching this film, which is about addiction, about love, about, the way trauma can be passed on i know that it's personal to both you guys and you know god knows you're absolutely right every single person maybe and definitely in this room and every single person i've ever met has a relationship with with addiction whether it be them or a family member and i could i just think about how helpful it might be to see this 
Like, if you were, like, what do you want someone who's watching this, who's maybe going through what you went through, to to take from watching this film? Hmm, that's a good question. I think if somebody's watching it, it might be good to see. You know, look at the look at the signs of people. I think Gloria at this point in the film, she's 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 long gone. She's lost. Um, if you see yourself in Junior, try to <laughs> try to get out yeah. of the the cycle of destruction, the cycle of, um, and that. Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's it's probably too much to try to answer. Um, I mean, it could be something like sorry to. I know no, it's yeah. for Jared, but like, I think talking about it maybe yeah. too, like having friends and talking about it, because I think we keep talking about how everyone's, they'll come up to us and say something super personal. It's like, why weren't you telling your friends that though? I think it's because it's not really allowed culturally. It's not encouraged. So part of it maybe is like sitting your friends down and telling them the truth about your home life or something you're going through. And then you might not hide it. And then you might, you know, be able to be held accountable or, you know, I think that I can't, you know, I, I don't know what it was like I couldn't know what it was like for you going through that, but I would imagine it felt alone also, which is a added burden. Yeah. Um, I think for people too that think they're the only ones going through it, it's like you're so close to the trees to see the entire forest. You you know, you, you can't see the entire picture. And I think there's so many people going through it. And I think if you just talk about it and at least acknowledge the beast, the monster under the bed, um, it's hard to imagine, but a year, you know, a couple years, you can start to feel you know, normal and not feel so isolated. And, uh, yeah, hopefully it can help people. I, I don't think it was meant to uh, scare people. I don't think it was meant to take, certainly wasn't meant to take advantage of no. um, a terrible affliction of many groups of people all over the world. It's, it shows a story and hopefully it can help people uh, break that cycle. Guys, listen, um, thanks for doing this. And also yeah. thanks for just being so open about that stuff. Yeah, That's thanks a lot. not easy, oh, so I appreciate it. Great talking with you. Thanks, guys. Mm-hmm.